Good morning and good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today for Economies in Recovery, Africa Outlook. Before we begin, let's cover a few housekeeping items. We will be recording today's session. The on-demand version of this webcast will be shared with you via email in the next few days. This webcast is being streamed through your computer, so for the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or your headset volume is turned up. For the best viewing experience, we recommend closing any programs or browser sessions you have running in the background. This will help conserve your bandwidth. Some networks cause slides to advance more slowly than others, so logging off your VPN is recommended. And if your slides are not progressing, push F5 on your keyboard or Command R on your Mac to refresh your browser page. At the bottom of your screen are multiple widgets, and I'd like to highlight a few of these. If you have any questions during the webcast, you can submit with these through the Q&A widgets. We will try and answer these during the session, but if we run out of time, we will answer by email. And please note we record all questions. There are additional materials available in the resource list. Please download those you might find useful. And you can find out more about our speakers via the speaker bio widget. We will be using interactive polling during the session and encourage you to participate. We value your feedback, so please do complete the pop-up survey at the end of this webcast. I am honored to introduce our moderator for today, our Head of Economic Content, Oliver Dansel fisher Over to you, Oliver. Thanks, Renee. Yeah, so um, welcome, everyone, and thanks for joining us on today's webinar. My name is Oliver Dansel fisher and my job is to make sure that our clients have access to the most useful economic data with which to base their business, policy, and investment decisions. So as Renee says, I'll be moderating today's session, and we have a fantastic lineup of speakers to take us through their views on how Africa is likely to perform as a region over the coming years. We'll cover some of the big themes like the impact of COVID-19 on the region, forward-looking growth forecasts out to the next 10 years, the recent African Free Trade Agreement, and also how does Africa fare when it comes to innovation? There'll also be several polls throughout this webinar to gauge opinion from our listeners, and I'll make sure I leave about five to 10 minutes at the end for some Q&A. So I personally recommend sending in as many questions as you can, and we'll try and cover as many of those as we can at the end. So before we do that, I'd quickly like to talk about um, DataStream, which is our premier platform and analytical tool for conducting the most in-depth financial and economic analyses. So what's DataStream? Well, it's used by everyone from central bankers, economists, policymakers, and financial institutions of all sizes to uncover the next big investment themes amongst different things. It also comes with a well-known charting tool, and all charts that you'll see in today's presentations can be directly recreated within this tool. For those of you who are new to DataStream, it has over 15 million economic time series, as well as millions of equities, bonds, derivatives, and foreign exchange series and can be accessed via both desktop and feeds. So I guess now turning now to Africa. So listeners are probably curious to know why we're hosting this webinar. So we here at Refinitiv believe that Africa is likely to be one of the most important, if not the most important investment hotspot over the next 10 years. Various different commentators and institutions have talked about this in recent times and to really test this hypothesis, We've made the addition of 500,000 nationally sourced economic time series from key sources, such as African national statistical offices and central banks, all on our data stream platform. So coupled with the international sources we carry, such as the OECD, World Bank, IMF, and so on, we've now got close to 1 million economic time series dedicated to analyzing Africa alone. So we really think that this is such a really good initiative. So users should be able to use this national data, for example, to spot investment opportunities early and can draw on international sources or cross comparison of the performance of countries on a comparable scale. So I urge all users, both current and those looking to explore the capabilities of data stream to go and investigate these data sets today. So that was that as a brief introduction to data stream and, and, and the purpose of this initiative. So I think now is very much a time to introduce our speakers and find out a little bit about themselves. Today we've got Asmita, Isaac, and Chris. Um, Asmita, would you like to introduce yourself and provide a quick 30 second overview of the work you do? Sure, thank you. And uh, good afternoon to everyone watching. My name is Asmita Pashotam. I do trade and development work looking at policy and research 
across a wide range of uh, trade related issues, trade and gender, African continental free trade area, looking at um, things around digital economies. So uh, I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Thank you very much. Perfect. Isaac, would you like to go next? Yeah, uh, Isaac Udendal. Uh, I'm an investment strategist, which basically means I look at the, uh, the intersection of macroeconomics and financial market developments. I work for uh, Old Mutual Multi Managers. We're part of the Old Mutual Group that has a presence in uh, 14 different African countries. Um, and I'm very pleased to be here because I'm a big fan of data stream. Perfect. I guess our central banker, Dr. Chris, would you like to introduce yourself and the type of work you do? Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Lowell. I'm the uh, head of the Economic Research Department at the Reserve Bank. Um, I primarily do macroeconomics as it uh, applies to South Africa. Uh, do, my team uh, produces forecasts and analysis that go directly into the monetary policy uh, decision-making process of the country. Thanks. Perfect. And um, for listeners today, Chris here is going to present something on Africa as a general, but very much with a South African flair. So um, I'll pretty much leave it to you, Chris, to um, present your presentation. I think you've got about 15 minutes, so the floor is yours. Thanks very much. Um, I'll go through my slides relatively quickly. Uh, while I'm, a, I'm primarily a South Africa macroeconomist, I suppose, uh, many years ago when I was in the Treasury, uh, I did a bit of uh, work on international economics and was quite involved in the SADC uh, macroeconomic convergence program, setting that up and doing some research for it. Uh, so I have some awareness of what's going on in the rest of the continent. Uh, and I thought I'd spend a bit of time talking about, I guess, from a high level and looking back at uh, some of the challenges that South Africa has faced, um, you know, what, what's, what's, what aligns with the rest of Africa and what matters to it in, from a South African perspective and what some of the challenges might look like going forward. So a couple of slides on South Africa in recovery. Uh, I'm going to say something about why South Africa's growth matters for the continent and show you a little bit what that looks like. Uh, then I'll get into a couple of slides on su Sub-Saharan Africa's output loss um, and what it's going to take to get back to a uh, higher, a faster rate of convergence really to the rest of the world. Uh, and I unpack that over a few slides. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about macroeconomic policy sustainability as well, but none, none of this very long. Uh, COVID cases, uh, as you probably all know, are roughly at their lowest levels uh, in quite some time in both South Africa and the rest of Africa. Uh, these numbers are, of course, heavily weighted by South Africa, both because South Africa is better measured, uh, but also it's, it counts for a lot in the overall weighting of these numbers. But uh, we've essentially gone through a second wave, and the question is, will uh, Africa get hit by a third wave like in the rest of the world? Uh, now, South Africa's response to um, the lockdowns and COVID uh, has been uh, pretty typical uh, for economies around the world. This slide, I'm just trying to show you a little bit of, of what that kind of looks like. Uh, and you can see on the left-hand side, that um, collapse in GDP is driven really by the red and the green bars there. So the red is households and their consumption patterns. The light green is the gross fixed capital formation. And there was a big move down in inventories, as you might expect. Uh, but uh, in contrast, external trade did quite well. And I'll come to that in the next slide. Going forward, um, a recovery should see a bounce back in most of those uh, demand uh, aggregates. Uh, in particular, we see uh, households coming back very strongly, and we've penciled in growth of 3.8% for next year. Uh, so 2020, a very, very large hit, uh, the largest hit in about 100 years. Uh, and then going forward, this kind of uh, a bounce back. But uh, the bounce back really depends on a variety of factors, and I'll come back to those uh, just now. From a kind of level of real GDP point of view, that's what I'm showing you on the right-hand side, uh, that we don't really see uh, 2019 levels being hit until 2023. So it's going to take some time. 
South Africa, uh, in our view, had a pretty textbook kind of macroeconomic adjust adjustment to the shock. Uh, it's most clearly seen in the current account balance. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm showing you a very, very long time frame going back to 19, 1970, excuse me, of what the current account looked like and the, and the two major components, the trade balance uh, and the net factor payments. And what these numbers are, of course, driven by is behavior of economic agents in, in the country. Uh, and so you will have a, or what we had was a drop off in, uh, in the consumption and import of consumer goods as well as capital goods. Uh, that's reflected in that household number coming down in the previous graph and the investment number coming down in the previous graph, but also by an increase in savings. So private economic agents in the economy saved a lot. That was important because, of course, it had to finance um, government's expansion in, in spending. So the government's fiscal reaction, in part, was an expansion in spending to, um, to cover uh, new health needs and social transfers and that kind of thing. Uh, and the, uh, the clawback of a higher savings rate that was driven by um, a private agents helped to finance that. Uh, but South Africa also benefited from the very strong terms of trade, uh, and I'm showing you that on the right-hand side, again, going back many, many years, this time to 1960. Um, and you can see what that looks like, uh, what that terms of trade looks like in 2020 on the far right-hand side. So uh, you, we will all remember the commodities booms of the 2000s, so kind of roughly to the, just to the 60% line, 2000 on the right. Uh, you had this commodities boom, which drove up that blue line pretty aggressively. And then you had a bit of a collapse in 2010, and then the bounce back in the, in the latest, latest period. Uh, and South Africa's um, uh, terms of trade um, shot up again, uh, partly because China's uh, recovery was faster after the, uh, during COVID or in the, in the, its own bounce back from COVID was faster, but also because of um, supply constraints as well as very strong demand for particular uh, uh, platinum group metals products, rhodium and palladium, uh, which uh, accelerated very, very strongly. So that terms of trade in, in turn flattered the trade balance on the left-hand side and contributed to this, uh, this current account surplus that we saw last year. So that's quite, quite a textbook kind of adjustment. Now let me move on um, to how that fed into or how, how you might think about how it relates to the rest of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so this graph is just showing you a very simple correlation between uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's real GDP growth, that's the red. Um, this is not including Nigeria or South Africa, um, and South Africa's own import growth. So what, what, what we want to see, of course, is the larger economies in Sub-Saharan Africa growing faster in the wake of COVID. Uh, and helping to pull along in a kind of locomotive sort of way uh, other countries. Certainly the correlation is there, uh, and that could be a positive if everyone were growing faster. Uh, if everybody grows uh, much slower, that will be, will be a negative. So it does matter. Um, when the IMF recently looked at uh, Sub-Saharan Africa's uh, prospects post uh, the pandemic, um, they uh, calculated a medium-term view of, uh, of output losses. Uh, and I'll show you on the next slide uh, a little bit more why this matters. But you can see it's for Sub-Saharan Africa is that blue column on the left-hand side, where the output loss over the medium term, which is three years, is actually quite significant. It's over 5% of GDP. Uh, for emerging markets as a whole, you've got the red uh, column, and that's at just about 4%, while for the rest of the world, which is in yellow, it's just under 3%. And if you look at advanced economies in black, uh, nearer to the right-hand side, you can see very, very small uh, permanent output loss from COVID-19. Now, that's kind of curious because um, the growth rates for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa are actually uh, are actually uh, have the growth rate hit that Sub-Saharan Africa got last year was fairly small. I think I've got a, some data on that a bit later. 
Um, but the issue here is that even though there's been less of a pandemic shock, uh, there's expected to be a much longer vaccination path. So uh, while growth rates, year-on-year -year growth rates for Sub-Saharan Africa were, were, were much smaller, something like 3% relative to, say, the U.S.'s uh, 8 or 9% to a South, 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 uh, South Africa, 7%. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa's growth rates were much smaller, but it's going to. But those growth rate negatives will persist for longer, uh, and it will take Sub-Saharan Africa longer to get back up. In part because of this problem, which is that vaccination coverage across the world uh, is expected to be very, very slow for much of the African continent. You can see that uh, right there. Uh, in the red from early 2023 onwards, uh, there is expected to be widespread vaccination coverage. So uh, the drag on economic activity caused by that slow vaccination is going to go on for some time. I, here's the data I was looking for. Um, so, uh, you know, a big, I'm going to finish the presentation in the next few slides with a series of questions, really, more than anything else. I mean, I think the big question for, for uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and the continent generally is how to speed back up to a faster rate of growth, how to speed convergence. On this left-hand side, um, this is the data I was looking for, you can see the 2000s and the 2010s. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa did very well in the 2000s. In fact, the rate of annual growth in GDP per capita was faster than the world average, uh, which is a really fantastic result. Uh, but by 2010s, that had 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 fallen, uh, and they were doing Sub-Saharan Africa was doing considerably worse. Uh, and then the question for us now is, well, how do you get back up to those those 2000s type growth rates? Uh, on the right hand side is just another uh, set of data that that shows you the same kind of thing. Uh, in U.S. dollar gross national income per capita terms for sub-Saharan Africa, you've got uh, the blue line, which is measured on the left-hand scale, and that's in U.S. dollars. Uh, but uh, so you see a very nice performance in the 2000 area with that blue line accelerating up. Uh, but the red line, which is the percentage of the world average, uh, you can see it's pretty stable. So it, it picks up a little bit in the 2000s and then suffers a knock right at the end there. Uh, so it's another way of looking at the same same problem. Uh, so again, post-COVID-19, um, how do we think about different drivers of economic growth? Uh, you know, this graph shows you from the IIF, just shows you that, um, that uh, 2014 was really the high point of capital inflows uh, into major sub-Saharan African countries. Uh, it decelerates over time in part because growth itself in sub-Saharan Africa was decelerating. Uh, and obviously going forward, we want to see a significant bounce back in those numbers. The 2021 expectation for capital inflows is on the right-hand side. And you, as you might imagine, there's a bit of a, a bounce back from the 2020 very low levels. But clearly one wants to strengthen this. Commodities uh, are still king, clearly. Um, commodity cycle and growth is correlated on the left-hand side. You can see very clearly that uh, real growth in sub-Saharan Africa still aligns very closely to commodity prices. Uh, but it's also true, uh, or it's fair to say, on the right-hand side, that export concent product concentration, if you can diversify, benefits your growth rate as well. Uh, and you can see on the horizontal axis, we're measuring from left to right uh, export product concentration index with those countries on the right being very heavily concentrated and those on the left being much more diversified. And you can see countries like Ethiopia and Rwanda, who, which had quite good growth rates, being less, uh, less concentrated. Obviously, that's not the only factor driving the better growth rates, but it probably contributes to some of it. So you want to see, among other things, uh, a way in which you use very strong commodity revenues to generate um, uh, economic diversification into other lines. Uh, obviously, keeping macro on track is really critical. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't make that kind of a point. Uh, you, we would want to see the inflation rate on the left-hand side uh, normalizing back down to something more appropriate. Uh, and more competitive, something uh, preferably well below 10%. Uh, 
uh, and inflation probably will decline uh, yet, but uh, going forward, but it does remain above uh, emerging market norms. Uh, inflation uh, is often driven by uh, difficulties in fiscal policy uh, and getting back to uh, a better level of fiscal sustainability would be useful. Uh, on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you um, public deficits, the debt levels and, and, uh, and deficit levels for sub-Saharan Africa region. Uh, and you can see that in the post-global financial crisis era, certainly budget balances took a, a sharp turn to being more negative, uh, and that uh, continued through the pandemic period, and then has driven up that public debt level. That's that red line on the left. Uh, general government revenues uh, are also clearly important. Um, you know, when I was in the Treasury many years ago, uh, the minister at the time uh, spent a lot of time arguing for uh, the strengthening of tax revenue administrations uh, around Africa. And, and here's why. Um, because it is very easy when institutional failure starts to come in for uh, things like tax revenue to slip, and that makes it more difficult for sub-Saharan African governments to finance the kinds of expenditures they need uh, on a very basic level to get uh, to get their economies moving and to build uh, education and infrastructure and all those good things. Uh, and you can see on the right-hand side how tax revenue as a percentage of GDP uh, compared to the emerging world started to slip. So that was that's my second to last slide. This is my last slide. Um, so, you know, how do, how do we think about things going forward? I mean, clearly in the near term, uh, South Africa is poised for a gradual recovery. Uh, we just released our monetary policy review where we suggested that part of the difficulty with the recovery is that it's very uneven. Sectors like uh, trade and tourism uh, and quite a few others have taken a very hard knock and are not going to get back up to speed very quickly. Uh, South Africa's growth certainly will matter for sub-Saharan Africa, but a lot more is needed to speed convergence back up to stronger growth rates in the region. Uh, and here are some thoughts about what some of those things might look like. You know, I think the capital flows data shows quite nicely that access to external finance has been preserved. Uh, the real question is, how do you make how do you make the most of it? So, how should sub-Saharan African countries? Uh, induce more capital in and do the right kinds of things with it to get the better growth rates. Uh, and here are some bullet points. So certainly importing capital, technology, building infrastructure. And this was the, 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 the takeaway lines from the World Bank's major study of uh, developing country growth run by Michael Spence some years ago. Uh, and clearly, there's a lot to be gained from spending quite a lot of that on, um, on greening the economy. Uh, African economies uh, are, are, uh, are in quite a beneficial position uh, because they don't have a lot of legacy brown or legacy as assets that need to be written off as part of that transition. So there's quite a bit to do there. Uh, demographics, of course, remains critical. Uh, young population, education needs to be much better. Uh, and you need to lower the supply cost of labor. So you need to be able to get young people uh, into urban environments where the jobs are uh, easily. Uh, clearly, and something we'll talk much more about, I'm sure, is ensuring the success of the tr free trade agreement uh, and also starting to develop much stronger links to global supply chains as they start to move around the world uh, in response to global events, uh, such as China becoming a higher cost production environment uh, and other kinds of drivers of those, those big movements. Uh, using commodity resources better and helping diversification, I pointed that to that. And then, of course, my, my old standby, which is macroeconomic stability uh, and getting your fiscal and your institutional underpinnings right uh, alongside sensible monetary policy. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I'm sure we'll have a number of questions on that in the end, but I'll just ask you a really quick one now, just because of this. Um, do you think that monetary policy will generally be kept quite loose as 
you know, we're still very much in the phase of COVID, or more specifically as Africa as a region, you know, continues to try and drive the recovery that they've, you know, very much needed from the pandemic. I mean, is it the trend very much to lose, or are we going to start tightening at some point, you think? Who, who are you talking about? South Africa? I'm talking, I mean, countries? yeah, I mean, I guess South Africa, but I mean, it's because you have a slide there of, of which sort of had a weighted average of, of policy rates kind of going down, didn't you? So, I mean, do you think the trend yeah. very much is to, I mean, you can just talk about South Africa uh, at this point if you feel that would be the best. Well, I, you know, I mean, I think there's some there's some significant differences between South Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, but, um, uh, you know, there are, I, I guess, some pretty important similarities, too. You know, we've been certainly lucky that as part of our um, transition through the pandemic, our inflation rate has remained very low. I mean, in fact, in many ways, that's made it possible for us to cut rates very aggressively. Uh, and because we expect inflation to remain quite modest, um, you know, our 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 uh, trajectory for the nominal repo rate uh, is pretty gradual. Also, so we we have negative real rates, and those negative real rates will reverse over time uh, slowly. But they will have, that will happen more slowly the better behaved inflation is. Uh, so, you know, that's an important mm -hmm. way I think to think about uh, where South Africa is. Uh, there are, are countries in sub-Saharan Africa where the inflation rate has picked up. Um, they're more exposed, say, to volatile food prices or other kinds of commodity prices. So the pattern of inflation uh, through the region is quite different um, than just what's happened in, in South Africa. Uh, and so that poses different kinds of, um, of policy challenges to, to those countries with higher inflation. Now, a big issue here, I think, also lies in the area of um, capital inflows. You know, if we really are moving into an environment where um, there's this broad reflation of the global economy and advanced economy monetary policies are going to remain very accommodative for a long time, uh, and as risk uh, kind of falls, then we will start to see capital coming back into countries that creates different kinds of dynamics for, for countries. First of all, it makes some countries that need capital but have uh, bad fiscal uh, metrics or high inflation, it makes it harder for them to achieve it, to get that capital in. And so those economies will have to make uh, tough decisions about monetary and fiscal policy, irrespective of what we do. Um, and then countries that have managed uh, better and have managed to keep uh, public debt under control and their fiscal balance is okay, they will get capital coming in. Um, and that creates other kinds of uh, policy challenges, but they're usually not uh, too tough uh, to deal with. So it's, it's quite a mixed thing. Uh, you really have to look kind of country by country and see what, what they've been doing. And it's, it's for this reason that much of the, uh, you know, the IMF World Bank's recent meetings uh, there's a lot of emphasis put on, well, just how much debt have developing and emerging economies put on in recent years, in part through just dealing with what their low growth problems, but also in dealing with um, the pandemic. And, and how much of a constraint will that be on these economies uh, going forward and how they, how they recover from the pandemic? So it's it's um, you know debt public debt is you know nicely I think quite correctly and nicely seen nowadays as a more serious constraint on economies than it was say five or ten years ago. Okay. Thanks. I hope perfect. that helps. No, that was perfect. Thank you. That was very very insightful. Okay, so I think now we can turn to a panel discussion. But first, this will be the first of of three polls. So. Over on your screen, if I got this correctly, we're going to do the first of the poll. So the voting buttons are there, um, and I'll leave this on a little bit just until we've got the majority of you who have voted. <laughs> 
So the question is, in your view, how long will it take to see economic recovery across Africa post-COVID-19? Perfect, we're almost halfway there. Just uh, a little while longer for those of you who haven't voted. I very much urge you to vote. I think I'll leave it there. So I think the majority of you said, in your view, how long will it take to see economic recovery across Africa post COVID-19? So 50% of you voted one to two years by 2022. Um, the next biggest category was at least 10 years by 2030. And a short amount of you were either not sure or were already seeing indications of recovery. So quite an interesting spread there. Okay, so I guess now part of the panel discussion. So the first topic I want to talk about is generally the impact of COVID-19 on, on, on markets, because we could talk about kind of many things. And I think this is quite topical because I guess funny things happen, you know, when you've got a pandemic and, 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 and uh, you know, lots of sort of money running around in the economy. So Isaac, I think a question for you, I'm probably going to start with you. You know, looking at this chart, are you surprised that stock markets, you know, across Africa seem to have all followed broadly the same trajectory as those in developed markets? I mean, are you, do you believe that they're broadly in line with what you might have expected them? I think, you know, it's quite an interesting correlation, isn't it, with the rest of the world? It is. I mean, I think the, look, the first surprise is just how global markets have responded. Um, yeah. Coming off those lows about a year ago. The... But yeah, I mean, I think the, the the correlation tends to be quite strong in periods like this, where there is some sort of big global macro event. You know, the old saying is that that all correlations tend to tend to go towards one. I mean, I think an important distinction here is between South Africa and and the other African market. South Africa, the market is dominated by global multinationals, basically, including a lot of big mining companies. And Chris spoke about commodity prices, especially the. the Platinum and group metals being quite high. Um, and therefore, you can see that, you know, the South African market is actually well above its pre-COVID level. Um, I think other markets tend to be dominated more by, by companies that sell into the domestic market. So they're much more pure play into their domestic economies. They tend to be dominated by banks, by um, cell phone companies, by some kind of consumer staples. So there you have much more reliance and exposure to to the domestic economy, um, which makes it quite interesting because, I mean, as Chris said, the, the, the GDP declines in many of those countries were not as bad as, as for instance, was the case in South Africa and, and you know, UK and across Europe, for instance. Um, but it also, you know, the, the, the recovery therefore might not be, but might not be quite as strong. Um, but yeah, all in all, if you take it at an aggregate level, um, if you look at sort of pan-African Equity benchmarks, you know, they 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 are they about in terms of in terms of regaining pre pre COVID levels. Mm -hmm. And I guess sticking with that theme, I mean, you know, there's there's always that interesting sort of correlation between how much the stock market effectively represents a real economy. I mean, you know, do you believe that the stock market is generally highly divorced from what's going on in the world in Africa across the regions? I mean, should we even matter? Should that even matter, do you think? Yeah. Um, you know, and that's a question that's being asked everywhere in the world with given the strong given the strong market performance. Again, in the case of South Africa, I think by our estimates, you know, the stock market 
kind of about a third of, of sales generated by JSE listed companies come from inside South Africa. So the rest is, you know, is global in nature. Nigeria is a great example because the economy is driven so much by the oil price. Um, and yet the biggest companies listed on the on the stock exchange there are not oil companies. Um, you know, again, banks, cell phone companies, some of the consumer staples. So I think in this instance, there's very much a, there's very much a divorce between kind of the big macro drivers at the at the national level uh, versus some of the specifics in terms of how the companies are, uh, you know, the companies operate and 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 the drivers of of their share prices. Okay, that's noted. And Chris, I, I want to re, um, revisit the, the the inflation topic that you talked about. So I guess from this graph, you know, if you just take those 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 you know major economies like South Africa, Nigeria, you definitely see the the, the bond yields kind of coming down, and, and in some cases they've slowly started to creep up. You know, more recently, I mean, I guess that's 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 a sign that inflation might start to increase. I mean, do, do you think that's broadly correct? I mean, should investors be worried? That that bond yields are starting to rise. What what, what do you think? Um, well, I'm not sure why their bond yields are rising. That's that's the, that's the important <laughs> question. I mean, for South Africa, you know, we've we've made the point at the bank that, um, you know, with our own rise in public debt um, and and uh, starting the pandemic with a fairly high deficit level. Um, it's expected, or it was expected, that that credit risk for the sovereign would rise, and so that's what explains a big chunk of that uh, spike in the ten-year bond yield that you're showing for South Africa. I don't know why Nigeria's is rising. I mean, it may be because the mix of commodity prices that they're getting, oil versus others, um, are wearing away at their fiscal balances, and so they're going to have to uh, raise more debt to finance themselves. Uh, and are pushing up yields for that reason. Uh, Kenya may have a similar kind of thing, although they're not a commodity uh, commodity country, as far as I know. So I, I'm not sure. I, you know, you probably have to unpack the. Uh, as as Isaac said, you you need to unpack the economics of each of these countries to uh, figure out exactly why the bond yields are rising. Um, you know, I, I suppose one angle on this. Um, that I'm certainly not all that familiar with, but many countries, of course, do some kind of um, pegging of their exchange rates to uh, the euro in particular, but also the dollar and other currencies, and, and that might play some role in some of these outcomes that you're seeing here. But I suspect it's fiscally driven. You know, it's just simply uh, borrowing more uh, to finance their recoveries, uh, and that being uh, in an environment where capital inflows are are pretty scarce. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Right, let's move on to our next topic. So general GDP growth forecast over the next 10 years. Um, so I think as Mita, um, I'll start with you on this one. So I mean, our partner Oxford Economics has a really good macroeconomic model that, that is well known the world over. It's probably the most robust forecasting model in the world. But I mean, it, it's obvious to say that different countries within Africa will experience different growth trajectories. Now, um, looking at the left-hand side, I mean, I knew Nigeria is obviously, um, you know, a really massive region, but are you, are you um, uh, surprised at uh, a country like Ethiopia having a very similar growth rate? And do you think that there should be other countries in Africa which potentially have very similar, if not higher, growth rates than the ones you see on the left-hand side? What do you think, Asmita? Um, thanks. No, I, I'm not surprised. Um, I think that there is, you know, countries, other countries, some countries have diversified better than other countries have across the continent. And I think that obviously uh, plays a role. I think that um, different regions in um, across the continent are also more integrated or better integrated uh, amongst each other. And they have different le and this different levels of integration kind of also feeds into the type of growth that some countries tend to experience. If you look at um, Ethiopia, also Rwanda has been uh, fairly well performing uh, recently as well. And there's pockets, I think, of best practice emerging outside of what of the traditional big economies. And I think that has been an interesting um, trend to witness, I, I presume, or maybe 
I think that it's not um, necessarily too surprising and might continue in, as part of the, of the COVID-19 recovery as well. Okay. And could you, could you potentially name a country which, which definitely is likely to have quite a growth high rate or is there none? Would you say that this is you know, broadly representative of, of, of what is likely to happen? I think that I, I think that there's different there's different sort of um, constraints that countries uh, face, and as as Chris had um, said in his previous previous presentation, growth obviously tends to mimic commodities, but we cannot be reliant on commodities going forward, especially when you look at something like the continental free trade area, especially when you look at the need for for value chain growth, when you look at the need for diversification, if you look at um, the sort of constraints that the continent faced, just in terms of something as simple as uh, PPE imports, you know, the big questions were raised. Mm -hmm. Why are we not producing this by ourselves? Why are we not setting up our own manufacturing hubs? We've got pockets of manufacturing entities. We have Morocco, we have ourselves, but you know, why is it that, you know, historically North Africa Arab market union has looked north towards servicing the European markets instead of, you know, looking at how do we integrate into the rest of the continent? How do we build value chains amongst ourselves? So I think that the pandemic has sort of um, brought these questions back to the forefront, you know, and uh, and has heightened the need, uh, obviously coinciding with the AFCFTA, for to look at what what we can do internally, where do we see potential for growth on the continent? Where can we leverage our own our own um, advantages, if you will? And how do we set ourselves yeah. up going forward? Where the next time something like this happens, which is an inevitability, I think um, it's only a question of when, not if something like this happens again. Can we be better placed regionally and continentally? To, to be able to withstand the impact of this better health-wise and uh, economically and financially. Perfect. Thanks for that. And I guess um, for listeners, looking at the right-hand side, the blue dark shaded blue dots is, is Africa, but the one just above that is Asia. And I guess they're very much in close competition. There's probably not that much, maybe 0.1, 0.2% out for the next 10 years. Isaac, I mean, turning to you, I mean, I know this is probably quite a big question. You won't be able to, you know, to, to answer it fully. But you know, in in your mind, what is likely to have, you know, the better growth prospects? Would you say Africa or Asia in the next ten years? And and I guess, you know, maybe maybe to sort of unpack that a little bit, maybe tell us about one or two key things that Africa as a continent potentially arguably do, do better than say Asia, which might help its growth prospects. I mean, any ideas on that? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, those are those are two very big regions, very diverse regions. Um, so I think I think really you want to look at it much more at a at a country by country basis. I mean, I do think I do think Asia at the moment has a lot of dynamism behind it, um, but it's couple, probably a couple of years ahead of Africa in terms of just the, the urbanization trend, uh, growing middle class, the integration into global value chains. So, so in a sense, I think being a couple of years ahead, um, I think I think Africa has has the opportunity to to kind of step up the pace um, and follow in those footsteps. And I think the one advantage that Africa has over something like China, for instance, China has grown phenomenally quickly, um, and it has done basically all the right things in terms of to, to get its growth rate as high as it has. But it has a terrible demographic profile. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas Africa has this very, very young population, um, and therefore, for and that young population is a massive opportunity. It is also a massive risk, um, and and therefore the you know it 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 it, uh, it, it could really go both ways. Um, and I think in terms of what Africa can do to 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 get much faster growth, I think the you know I think we'll talk about the, the free trade area in a minute, and I think that is a that is a key a key development. But really. It's also, um, Chris spoke a lot about the institutions, and those are much harder to fix. Very, very really important. Um, and then something just very, as simple and as practical as as electricity. You know, um, most of the people who don't have access to electricity live in Africa, and and if you can just if you can just increase the rates of connectivity either to the grid or to some of these great off-grid solutions we have these days, 
um, you know, that could go a long way to to boosting growth rates in Africa. Um, I mean, ultimately, the growth rates, the growth profile for Africa should look pretty good because it's coming off it's coming off such a low base, and there's such great scope for uh, for catching up with the rest of the world. Okay, perfect. So. Now I'll quickly move over to the second poll, just conscious of a little bit of time. Which country do you believe will see the highest level of economic growth in the next 10 years? I'll leave this slide up for the next 30 seconds. So please vote now. Perfect. I'll cap that off for now. So I guess Niger Nigeria has the highest growth prospects at 30.2% of the vote, followed closely by Ethiopia. So in a way, very much corroborates what the data has said. Okay, so big topic now, the African intercontinental trade. So, you know, for, for people who probably already know about this, this was a major trade deal signed. Um, which covers virtually all of the African region. Um, and that's what I, you know, effectively want to sort of want to talk about here. What's really interesting about this is, is the, you know, the massive scale of South Africa's import and es export trading within the actual region. And the fact that, you know, if you were to look at those other sort of countries, that their share of trade within Africa is, is a lot less. Um, as a meter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn to you. I mean, do you, do you believe Africa as a whole has a necessary infrastructure to fully benefit from this trade deal? I mean, are we, you know, just to sort of, you know, I mean, do you think we're likely to see trade being concentrated in in regions where, say, West African nations were more likely to only trade with themselves because of infrastructure issues? What do you think? I think that um, not all countries are going to reap the benefits equally, and what really in the beginning. And what becomes important is, of course, implementation, how um, how lower-income countries and fragile countries are assisted with the implementation. Um, as you correctly said, we do not have uh, well-developed trade facilitation infrastructure throughout the continent. We have some regions that are doing better than others. For example, East African community, they have one, they're rolling out a series of one-stop border posts. But the, the truth is that, you know, it can cost you three times to transport something across the continent than, you know, exporting it to a European or an Asian market. So I think with all trade deals, generally speaking, um, it it can be a general win in terms of welfare gains or enhancing intra-regional trade. But of course, there will be specific sectors or industries that lose out in a, as a short-term as a short-term repercussion. And so the question then, of course, becomes how do you how do you help mitigate the, the potential impact, negative impact that that the AFCFTA could have on those industries? I think the other important thing to remember is that. Even though the trade agreement has been signed, it's not actually, and trade can commence based on uh, specific uh, based on specific lines or specific products that have been um, already offered and received. The reality is that negotiations are still ongoing, so it is mm -hmm. um, the will is important. The the fact that countries are preparing the implementation strategies, the fact that negotiations are ongoing and haven't stopped as a result of COVID, even though they have been delayed, they all um, signal the right kind of development going forward. But the reality is that um, you will have to have sort of all the dots um, dotted and all the T's crossed before you can really start looking at what the AFCFTA can offer all countries. And the reality is that there's going to be obvious bigger players that will get the benefits first and then and then whether and how the implementation happens for smaller countries will really will really determine whether the AFCFT becomes this um, 
becomes a severe deal, deal changer for, for the continent or whether it falls by the wayside. Okay. Perfect. And Chris, turning to you, I mean, what kind of message do you think this sends to the rest of the world, the African free trade deal? I mean, do you think it's very much we're open for business, or do you believe that we're likely, or the Africa continent is likely to see a lot more, say, foreign direct investment as a result of this trade deal? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I think the, yeah, the, you know what I don't know. What I don't know enough about the trade deal is the extent to which, and maybe as Mita could could talk to this one, is the extent to which it generates um, a kind of healthy trade diversion, right? So that you you stop having so much um, external trade between individual countries and other parts of the world, and you and you start to get. Uh, manufacturing and other kinds of trade going on between African economies uh, in a much more intensive way. I, my my rough sense would be that um, you know most of the rest of the world would 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 welcome that uh, because I think it would it would signal that um, it would signal that uh, you know Africa as a kind of regional economic entity. Uh, has has legs, right? And so it would start to draw in a different kind of investment um, that that Africa probably needs. Uh, and what I mean by that is that you know you you've got all these trading links that spoke out from the continent rather than than mesh inside. Uh, and and the kind of investment you need to get those trade links between African economies are things like much better infrastructure, much much better telecommunications, that kind of stuff. Um, which are difficult to do because they're big and they're expensive, uh, but they are the kinds of things that would make a huge difference, I think, to uh, the kind of um, I don't know what you call it, economic density or the interactions uh, between African economies, which which would be the right measure of success for the trade agreement. Perfect. And I guess sticking with you, Chris, because I really want to quickly cover off innovation before, in the interest of time. So you know. There's a lot of talk about investing in Africa and, and Africa being quite an innovative, you know, country in terms of investments. So you've got the likes of China wanting to invest in Africa. You've got the likes of Silicon Valley with Square, PayPal, Facebook, so on and so forth. And there's obviously other types. There's green investment. There's financial investment. I mean, do you have any thoughts on green green investment and innovation in general um, in Africa? Uh, well. I mean, there are some pretty striking statistics out there. I mean, one that came to me uh, that I came across the other day was that of mobile mobile money transactions as a share of GDP in Africa, they are almost twenty five percent, whereas in the rest of the mm -hmm. world, they're five percent. So, I mean, there's tons of kind of financial transactional innovation that's been going on for a long time, uh, and and that's that's hugely uh, impressive, I think, and and should draw the right kinds of investment and innovation. I, certainly in the green area, I, I mean, there, there's a lot to that as well. I mean, you know, the big problem with with greening your economy is what do you do with um, a, a whole bunch of plant and equipment that's been built over many years, but ha still has a very long lifetime to it. That's not so much of a problem in many African economies, um, for starters. So you could get the kind of investment coming in and not have to write off a big chunk of your capital stock. Uh, you also have a young population um, that, you know, if you put enough uh, uh, funding into education, could be brought up to qu speed quite quickly with these new kinds of technologies. So I, I think there's a lot of possibility there. There's, there's fantastic water resources. Uh, there's fantastic solar resources. Obviously, these things di differ quite a lot per country and per region of the continent. Uh, but the raw material that is uh, for these kinds of investments uh, are are there, and the and the productivity gains that Africa would get from it are very large. I mean, this is why I made this this fairly cryptic point in my presentation that. You know, I think the, the returns to investment are very high in Africa if you, you know, uh, you can start getting the ball rolling and the returns start to, uh, to, to, to reinforce each other in different areas. So education, infrastructure, greening, that kind of thing. Thanks. Okay. 
Perfect. So I guess we've just got about five minutes left. I wanted to the last poll, but I'm going to skip that. So we'll just skip straight to the Q&A. So I guess this one is first. Um, the first one is, is, how do we see a recovery in the labor market, i.e. employment numbers relative to GDP and or household consumption? So I guess that's either for Isaac or for you, Chris. Why doesn't Isaac take it? Yeah, Isaac, go for it. Um, <laughs> go for it, Isaac. That's a, yeah. um, look, I, th I think in general, I mean, I think, I don't know if this question is specifically for South Africa or for the rest of Africa. The, 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 the pattern globally has been that the recovery in GDP is much faster than the recovery in employment, even though the recovery in employment, specifically in the U.S., has been quite impressive. Um, so... You know that that obviously is a bit of a drag on on household spending, but but again, it will really depend on on the country. You know, for instance, in South Africa, that drag on household spending is offset somewhat by by lower interest rates. That's not necessarily going to be the case in 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 other countries. Clearly, also some countries um, very dependent on, on tourism. Um, you know, some of the smaller island nations, for instance, on the continent, mm -hmm. and there the the you know the recovery in employment is very much is really out of the hands of of, of policymakers in those countries. So, um, yeah, but yeah, I think in general you would expect employment to recover more slowly than GDP. Perfect. Okay, second question. This one's for you, Asmita. So. Two of the three biggest trade relationships in Africa are already within the customs union, SACU. The largest trade relationship is within SADC, which is already which already has a fairly free trade. Where are the AFCFTA opportunities? Thanks. I think um, it's important to remember that a lot of the the trading relationship within SADC is obviously driven by South Africa. And then when you pull South Africa out of the equation, you can see that it's actually quite stagnated. Um, even though we have a free trade area, there's lots of non-tariff barriers that are still in place. I mean, you only have to look at the, the border up north to see how slowly trade moves across borders to understand that or to appreciate that. So, I mean, we've spoken a lot about that already. There's obviously manufacturing um, opportunities. There's a need to enhance our self-reliance. Um, there's a need to move beyond um, exporting of commodities and to value added, uh, valid and production. I think the one thing that we haven't necessarily spoken about as much is trade and services. I mean, I, if I'm not mistaken, there was a report Last week, I think it was in the news saying that South Africa has amongst the best financial services offerings in the world. So it shows that, you know, it doesn't only have to be South Africa that can compete on that uh, kind of platform. And there's no reason why something like the AFCFT cannot build other countries' capacities in these kinds of, um, in these kinds of other, other areas of trade. So I think that, um, I think that the opportunities require the right kind of strategies behind them. And I think, like I said, it's really about how it gets implemented. And it's, of course, bearing in mind some of the fiscal constraints that countries already face in terms of recovering from the pandemic, how this one unfold. And I'm happy to uh, provide a bit more of a detailed answer. But uh, in the interest of time, I'll leave it at, uh, at that. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Asmita. And I guess, Chris, you've got the last um, one here. So the question for you is, do you see a re-emergence of debt problems across the region in light of weak recoveries from the pandemic? Could we, for example, see a wave of defaults? Uh, well, I, I mean, you're better off uh, looking at, um, you know, the advice of the IMF and the World Bank on these issues. Um, they just released lots of reports talking about precisely this. Uh, it's certainly possible. Um, you know, the pandemic has, has stressed economies uh, into bigger deficits and higher debt levels. Um, you know, the trick is: will those are those debt levels sustainable going forward? Uh, and can the can these countries keep uh, the cost of capital low? And that's that remains to be seen. Thanks. Perfect. Okay. So I guess that's the end of our webinar. Renee, could I leave you to have a last few moments to talk about what we can expect, um, um, what listeners can expect in terms of resources? Great. Thank you for joining us today, everyone. We will be sending out the recording and additional resources via email to you in the next couple of days.
And if you need to contact us, emia.marketing at refinitive.com. Thank you for joining us.